evaluation of toxicity. Let me just open all of the chat and so on. So uh, to, uh, again, uh, uh, laser pointer. So uh, a brief reminder: today it's a Friday, eleven. Today we will have uh, cell culture. Well, I called in schedule cell culture methods and methods introduction. So probably yes. Uh, today we will have an organism toxicity test and today we will have a presentation, three people today, so be prepared. And again, a reminder for all of you, now I have only one report downloaded in report folder uh, from Alexandra Predena. And I remind you that if you do not upload your a short report, so presentation, it's just one part of your, well, of your reports you should upload some text up to five lists uh, well on your topic. And this will give you 20 points. And for now your point standing looks not very good. So it's just a very good opportunity for you to increase your points. So please upload your report in reports folder until the exam. So there is not much, not much time left. Uh, so, uh, what I'll be talking today to you, it's, uh, well, about cell cultures. And uh, maybe not all of you are familiar with, uh, at least you are familiar with the term, what is cell culture. Uh, and uh, probably for some of you, culture is still something connected with science scenes, with uh, uh, very beautiful buildings and so on. And uh, what is cell culture? Well. Uh, I want to give you a very brief introduction in history of cell biology and uh, well history not very interesting in some cases but I want you to give why I want to, to give it to you because uh, when you just uh, some of you I hope some of you already worked with the cells so when you start in working with the cells uh, it looks very difficult to you because it's a lot of protocols, it's a lot of different things you need to do, it's a lot of uh, uh, things connected with st uh, sterile conditions, uh, cell media, cell uh, different proteins, enzymes used in cell cultivation and so on. And this is, looks very difficult for, uh, for the one who never worked with cell cultures. But uh, just for you to understand, there is no hard uh, to work in with the cells because uh, the history of cell cultures uh, originated from the works of Claude Bernard uh, back in 19th century. And uh, uh, as you can see from this picture, it's a Claude Bernard here in the center, working with some kind of rabbit uh, tissues. And uh, he was the founder of endocrinology. And he was the first to understand that uh, some of the tissues can be growth uh, in in vitro conditions. So it's already like uh, 200 years past almost and uh, 200 years past in the uh, investigation that something can be cultured in vitro. So a lot of time. Uh, but uh, a bit later, maybe 20, uh, 20 years later, uh, Wilhelm Rooks, who was an uh, embryologist, uh, well, it showed the first possibility to preserve some living tissues outside of the body. It was a chicken embryo, but still it's some, even not the pictures, uh, in, 19, uh, in uh, uh, 1885 there was uh, no, uh, no options to produce some pictures, so it's some drawing, some painting of chicken embryo and how it dividing. Uh, and well, uh, some of the uh, close to recent investigation was uh, in the end of 19th century. So American physician Leo Loeb, who is shown here, uh, found that some of the blood and connective tissue cells can be maintained in a viable state in air in a liquid drop so its liquid drop was taken from an organism from an animal organism so it's like a lymph or something like this one uh, and in uh, 1898 uh, by as i believe it's norwegian or finnish scientists uh, Jungen, uh, he showed that some of the human skin and explants so it's original article from a past century not even the past two two centuries ago, 
uh, showed that some of the explants can be maintained in some acidic environment and so on. So even uh, in 19th century, it was uh, possible to maintain some tissues uh, outside of organism, the ability of these tissues. Uh, and well, uh, most of the findings, uh, of course, was done in 20th century. In the very first uh, decade of the century, Ross Garrison, who is shown here on the picture, uh, as you can see, there is a lot of petty dishes on the table and some kind of microscopes already and so on. So Ross Garrison showed that uh, some of the lymphatic thrombuses so the lymph clot uh, can be maintained on a cover slip uh, located over well in a glass light. So there was, a, well, a cover glass, so just a glass, and uh, on the opposite surface of this glass there was a drop and uh, he uh, uh, investigated uh, some cell division and the viability of this drop, uh, which was uh, located so on the other slide. Why uh, so difficult technique? Because all of the microscope was direct microscope. So objective of this microscope was from the top of this microscope. There was no inverted microscope at this moment. And I will tell you who invented and uh, uh, inverted invented inverted microscope. So so all of these techniques with uh, uh, with the uh, uh, how it's called uh, drop um, hanging drop technique so uh, drop of the liquid so a lot of difficulties uh, for the scientists without inverted microscopes so still uh, Ross Garrison in uh, 1907 uh, observed the growth of nerve cells and here is a picture so it's already a century past and this is a very nice observation and very nice drawing of a growth of nerve cells uh, which is like growing at the rate of one micron per minute very fast for a cell to notice uh, and uh, a lot of things to history of cell biology done by alexis carroll uh, uh, again in 1913 uh, and this uh, man was uh, a surgeon, uh, and since he was a surgeon, he very, uh, was very knowledgeable of different aseptic matters and add a lot to, uh, to a lot of principles uh, to cultivation of animal cells in vitro. But uh, as, all great, uh, as all great scientists, they're very uh, contro uh, controversially picked um, uh, man because he was uh, a Nobel Prize winner in medicine and he was uh, uh, invented a perfusion pump but at the same time he was the one who uh, led uh, eugenic uh, policies in Vichy France so well a Nobel Prize but some some of the things that are not very good now for so uh, but still, he do a lot to uh, his to development of cell biology. Uh, and there is one man, probably some of you worked with Ringer solution, and now you no know how the Sydney Ringer looks like. Uh, and uh, at the same time, in the 30s uh, 30 years, uh, a lot of different things prior to the Second World War uh, was done in uh, development of uh, cell culture, there was development of trypsinization, and in 1937, uh, Simpson Stillman used some uh, techniques to pass the cells. To pa pass the cells, it's mean uh, culture cells, so passivation. Uh, maintain cells out of an organism and this was probably the first things uh, connected with uh, cells cultivation there was an article published uh, in this year and here how the cells looks like probably this is one of the first images of cells and uh, for those of you who are familiar with the cells now uh, if you go back uh, to the very first picture this is a modern picture of cells it's just uh, obtained uh, well almost now let's say and this is how the image looking back in 1937 uh, quite nice looking need to say considering the microscopic techniques 
Uh, and in uh, already after the war, uh, in 1948, uh, uh, Earl, it's one of the, again, one of the main scientists who uh, contributed a lot to, to cell biology. Uh, he was able to culture some uh, culture, already not a, a single cell, cell culture, uh, and he developed a lot uh, of uh, culture media and so on. And this already looks like a cell culture. So we are 50 or already 70 years far from the first developments. But of course, a revolution in cell cultures was uh, uh, obtaining of hella cells. So uh, why HeLa cells? Probably, uh, probably some of you worked with HeLa cells. Why they are called HeLa? Because they were obtained from a Henrietta Lacks. Uh, and uh, this one, the man who obtained these cells, uh, this uh, carcinoma cells, so tumor cells, and he obtained them, uh, the cells, without any permission. And there was a lot of talks in the uh, 70s because the, when it's become obvious what are the source of the HeLa cells. But still, despite of all of this talking about uh, is it uh, correct or not correct to obtain some cells without permission from a patient, Still, in 1952, uh, George Otto J uh, obtained these cells, and he, uh, maybe three years ago, Eagle investigated what should be a nutritional requirements to grow the human cells. So it was very hard to understand what should be a uh, composition of a cell media to maintain this growth. And, well, probably the most important man who is still alive uh, it's uh, Leonard Hayflick, and in uh, 1961 he found what is called now a Hayflick limit. Uh, it's a limit, uh, uh, well, almost for all cells, a division limit. So the cells can divide for more than about 50 generations, and after this uh, amount of generation, the cell will die because of telomeres, so we will discuss it later. But uh, Leonard Hayflick uh, also was inventors, uh, inventor of inverted microscope. So this is the first man to invent inverted microscope and well, probably it helps him a lot in uh, understanding what is Hayflick limit and uh, how it affects a cell culture division. Uh, and so uh, he also contributed a lot in uh, pr producing of cell culture and investigated the PubDuet cell culture media, uh, which is very suitable for uh, our purposes. Now, so, well, of course, there was a lot of other, uh, other discoveries uh, after uh, 1961, but still this is the main, uh, main steps, main achievements in history of cell biology, and now we will need to go to a HeLa cells. So the cells was the first one, and this is a, well, Henrietta Lacks, uh, and this is the HeLa cells. Uh, and what's so special about HeLa cells? Uh, uh, scientists and researchers in many laboratories uh, all over the world still working with HeLa cells. Uh, they are still alive, so the Henrietta Lacks uh, we may say uh, that she is immortal and she is living even now, but uh, there's a lot of time passed. It's almost 70 years and uh, these cells, they are immortal because they can divide uh, unlimited time because of telomerase enzyme. Uh, and again, we will discuss telomerase a bit later. So for now, these cells are almost non-human already because there's a lot of mutation accumulated through these decades and uh, there's even opinion in uh, scientific community so this uh, man is uh, Lex van Velen he's already dead but still uh, he's one who said that uh, hella cells have nothing uh, made with the human cells so well, if we look on uh, genome of HeLa cells, uh, similarity with the human genome like 89% or something like this one. So HeLa cells are even f more far from a human than maybe some pigs or monkeys. 
So, to be honest, this man was the one who uh, separate hell cells in a separate uh, species. So, uh, he, probably he or some of his colleagues even give a special name for this new species. But uh, for now, scientists uh, think that this was just a, well, not a fake but they do not agree with the uh, uh, opinion on f of uh, Van Velen. But uh, as for me, well, I think the hell cells for now, it's not a good option for testing some of your drugs or nanoparticles and so on, because they're really very far from a human cells now, very, very far. So the question is, uh, are hell cells still human, a, a very, uh, very let's say a lot a, a, lo a lot of talks in uh, human society about is it still uh, human or not but uh well uh, let's proceed to other things uh what is hella cells well hella cells called a secondary culture but there's also a primary cell cultures and uh probably you had uh some of this question in your very first test, introductory test, about what is can be called uh, about hepatocytes. So uh, when we take something from a human organism and start to cultivate this, this is called a primary culture. So this primary culture is just taken from a human organism. And some of the cells cannot differentiate, so uh, they cannot divide. Uh, they uh, cannot divide and cannot maintain their life for a long time. So almost all of the, all the primary cultures obtained from a human organism, still the same hepatocytes from a liver, they will uh, undergo some uh, degeneration and in, uh, so in the end they will die, definitely. So there is no way to maintain the cells for a decades like a cell cells so that's why the cell cells are so unique so they are immortal uh, in comparison with other primary cell cultures but still primary cell cultures can be used for example in drug screening so you can take some uh, tumor cells from a human uh, and you can use this uh, tumor cells to screen some drugs to understand uh, uh, what, uh, what kind of drugs can be used to treat uh, people to treat uh, this particular man from uh, from a cancer. So primary cell cultures are very useful, but uh, to test some of your drugs in laboratory routine, to test some nanoparticles, probably you need some secondary cultures. So after the primary cell culture uh, replanted or receded or passivated, they become a secondary culture. So definitely not a crops, so forgive my Google Translate, I just a bit lazy to check uh, if something uh, if something was wrong with this, so it's not, not a crops, obviously. Uh, well, um, uh, so uh, secondary cell cultures, almost all of the cells, not all, but not almost, but all of the cells, for example, used in our laboratory, it's a secondary cultures because they are cultivated for uh, decades already, for years. And uh, well, uh, with the term of uh, primary and secondary cell cultures connected to terms of limited and unlimited cell lines. Now, well, what is limited? Limited, it means that life, life, uh, lifespan of these cells are limited to a half-like limit, to a maybe 50 generation, 40 generation, or even one generation, because, for example, human hepatocytes uh, will not divide. So you can maintain their life for maybe a week, maybe two weeks, but they will definitely, uh, they will definitely die. Uh, but Hell cells, which is endometrial cancer, they will divide uh, very successfully for uh, months, for years, and so on. Maybe not years, but still for some months. And this is connected with telomerase. So tel uh, this telomer and on DNA uh, molecule, and this telomer used for a landing of RNA template during cell division. So when cell divided, they should divide, uh, uh, not divide, but multiply it double 
uh, a chromosome uh, double DNA amount and to double this DNA uh, some of the RNA to play used to uh, double this DNA molecule and if the uh, and after uh, each of the division part of the telomere uh, gone so telomere length decreasing after each division and where uh, and when there's no more uh, telomere there is no more division so the cell becomes nascent so they will stop division and die so some of the scientists think that uh, shortening of this telomere ends uh, is a cause of aging uh, and maybe some telomerase so it's enzyme which uses to add some uh, bases to telomere ends uh, so some telomerases can be used to prolong human life. So why are hella cells immortal? Because there is a very high activity of telomerase enzyme. But uh, meaning, uh, uh, um, but as again, if you look on hella cells, there is a lot of mut mutations in hella cells only due high activity of telomerase. So if we will have some, uh, if we will use we humans will use some telomerase enzyme as a drug, as a treatment for aging. We'll definitely will accumulate some of the mutations and this mutation will lead to cancer. So uh, we need uh, to, uh, let's say, understand uh, we live in shorter but without cancer or we live in longer but with cancer. And, meaning, uh, and living with cancer will well uh, this will lead to not a long life after all so it's a very complicated question but still telomere and telomerase are used to uh, make uh, some limited or unlimited cell lines but uh, in our human organism uh, with uh, it's not only a telomere which connected with uh, limitedless or unlimited uh, un unlimited cell lines now, there are also some term as differenti uh, differentiation of cells. So some of the cells are differentiated and some not. And uh, which not, they call the stem cells. And uh, well, some differentiated, differentiated cells, it can be muscle cell, and neuron cells, uh, sperm cells, immune cells, for example. Uh, neurons cannot divide anymore, so we have some amount of neurons from our life well now it is uh, already known that some of nervous nervous cells can divide but still uh, some of the cells uh, defended from stem, uh, stem cells and uh, they can be only maintained and they will die for example blood cells within some days four days week maybe uh, and so on uh, so some of the cells are cell lines are limited and some of cells unlimited. You should understand this. And uh, despite uh, limit, uh, limited or unlimited, doesn't matter, there's some other cell types and cell morphotypes. So uh, it's uh, not very connected with uh, limitedless or not because cell morphotypes, what I mean, it can be some fibroblast-like cultures, epithelium-like cultures or lymphoblastic cultures. Uh, in our organism, as you can see, there are some cells uh, that are, mm, let's say, like blood cells. They are flowing in our blood. And there are some cells like bone cells, which are located in bones. So some cells form in a tissues like epithelial cells and some cells are not. So blood cells uh, or lycocytes, for example, a lot of blood cells, lycocytes, platelets and so on. They are so-called suspen suspension cultures. So they are in, uh, flowing in liquid. And some cells, like epithelial cells, they're called uh, adhesive cultures. So they are growing on some substrate, on some surface. They need some surface to grow. It's a main condition. And among these uh, adherent cells, it's like they can be like fibroblast cells, epithelium cells, and so on. And lymphoblastic cells, they are growing just in culture media. So they just flow in. They need substrate. They don't need substrate to grow. And even in, so it's a picture of hella cells. 
Uh, and uh, if you look on this picture, uh, you may wonder why there are so different morphotypes of the cells. So uh, some cells looking like fibroblast cells, some cells look like epithelium cells, and some cells even look like uh, some lymphoblastic cells. It's because these cells on different type of uh, growth, let's say. Because, for example, these cells, uh, uh, so these cells are, uh, well, maybe on the very early stage of its growth, so it look like a spindle-like shape. Uh, these cells pro cell probably dead, so after the death, they lose connection with cell culture, sub uh, cell substrate uh, on which it grows and become, well, spherical. And, uh, well, this cell probably it have no space for growth because uh, it's surrounded by other cells. And uh, the, since the cells look like a gel, they can change their form to adapt to uh, other cells form. So even in one culture, you, you can see some different cell morphotypes, but uh, just for you not to wonder. Uh, but if we're talking about uh, cell adhesion, uh, cell adhesion is very, very important uh, when we're talking about the cells because cell adhesion is connected with cell viability. If the cell need to be uh, adhered to uh, some substrate, if the cell lose this uh, adhesion, uh, the cell will probably die because there's a lot of things connected with adhesion, not to just substrate, but to an other cells. Now, and uh, as you can see how it looks on scanning electron microscope, it looks very, very nice. Uh, and uh, what is connected with cell adhesion? We already discussed it in previous lecture about tight junctions between the cells. So these tight junctions used for the cells to, uh, well, let's say, communicate with each other and connection to a cell substrate also used for, not for some communication, but for cell to understand where the cell is located and what is surrounding and so on. And from the opposite side, these uh, connections connected with uh, cytoskeleton. So if some damage done to cytoskeleton, some damage will done to adhesion of the cells to each other or to extracellular matrix. That's why damage to cytoskeleton is very important. Uh, and as you can see, there can be cell-cell junctions and cell matrix junctions. So it's just two different types of junctions of a cell. Uh, and uh, well, uh, probably we have uh, we have how many slides we have? We have 15 slides to left, and there's some uh, specifically specific uh, things to discuss. So probably I will give you a test now uh, and we will proceed uh, after you complete a test i hope you will and uh, uh well uh, i'm not sure what uh, what alexei want to say about useless uh human useless uh, discussing what uh, what are the cell looks like uh well, uh, definitely in normal organism cells are 3D organized. So uh, cell cultures already it's some assumption of uh, how cells looks like an organism because uh, most of the hand cells, they are monolayer cells. So they form in just one layer on a substrate. And uh, well, definitely in uh, our organism, the cells uh, form some 3D structures, so parenchyma of organs, uh, but uh, why uh, scientists using uh, these monolayer cultures? Everything we will discuss cell spheroids, 3D cultures uh, a bit later. Uh, uh, all of this, uh, this monolayer structures, it's just a limitation of nutrient influx. So when some cells grow in on bottom and some cells grow in on top, there is no way to some nutrients pass through one cells to another. So the bottom cells will die just because of uh, lack of nutrients and lack of uh, different uh, valuable proteins and serum components and so on. Uh, that's why it's uh, just uh, handy to 
cultivate the cells in a monolayer form. So, but for now, yes, of course, scientists understand that some of the cell cultures are, are not very similar to a human organism, and 3D cell cultures uh, should be used to uh, assess some toxicity in a better way. Uh, well, yeah, I agree. It's, uh, so I, I just explained it. Why, why, why it's happened to uh, why it's happened now about monolayer cultures? Okay. Uh, so that's about cell adhesion and uh, what other special thing that you need to know when we're talking about cell cultures it's a mitosis so almost every cell can divide and well this division called mitosis and there's a lot of phases of mitosis uh, well Probably there's no need to remember all of them because you always can find this information uh, in internet and Wikipedia and so on. Uh, but uh, just just a, a bit of information. Uh, there's two phases if we are talking about mitosis or not mitosis stage because it's uh, well mitosis stage and interface stage. And this uh, interface stage can be divided into G1, S, and G2 stages. Uh, sometimes cell can skip, uh, not skip, but uh, enter G0 stage. So it's just a cell waiting for something. Uh, and if we're talking about mitosis, so it's uh, uh, considering all of our, all other type of stages, uh, this is a very short one. And there's a lot of prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and well, cytokinases. Uh, and uh, in some, when you stain your cells, if you ever worked with them, in some cases you even will be able to see the uh, telophase stage. It's very easy to see this uh, microfilaments uh, stained here with green, or maybe a metaphase. Uh, so cells have different phases and on these different phases of cell life there's different types of metabolites protein synthesizers and cell it's different activity of genes different activity of enzymes and so on and because of these different activities uh, there's different impact of nanoparticles on cells since we are talking about nanoparticles after all so there's different impact on the cell, on cell compartments in different stages of cell life, of cell division. Uh, and because of this, you always need to understand what uh, stage uh, your cell is currently in. And this is possible to understand. Uh, well, how is this possible? Uh, because, uh, for example, Again, if you know, if you do not know, now you will know when the cell scientists perform some investigation of uh, toxicity of nanoparticles or other toxic compounds, they're using cells when they are not filling the cell substrate uh, up to 100%. So if you're looking on, for example, some cell uh, density, I mean, uh, for example, on, uh, on this picture here, yeah? Uh, the cell density almost 100%. So every space is filled with the cells. Same as here. But if you look on this picture, there's some uh, free spaces, some voids between cells. And this is well substrate, a plastic tube or something like this. And when you're working with cells, uh, uh, some of the cell cycles, uh, cell stages, uh, stages of cell cycles depend on free space. Uh, because if cells have a lot of space to grow, they will, will grow, divide, grow, divide, and so on. But when there's not many space to divide, they will probably enter into G0 uh, stage and wait for free space. And since the cells are, well, not immortal, cell culture may be immortal, but cells not, uh, so, and you add some toxicants after all, so if some of the cell will die, the cells which are located in proximity to the cell will occupy this space. So they will understand that the space is free and they will divide. And if you are using the cells, for example, in G0 phase, uh, uh, which are grows, uh, grow, uh, have grown up to 100%, 
the cell culture will be synchronized. So it's a synchronous cell culture. Well, when all of the cells are in the same phase. And when you're testing some of your nanoparticles, it is always, you need always to understand in which phase your uh, cells exist now. Because some of the nanoparticles will affect uh, your cells differently when you uh, try to when you try to assess the toxicity properties on cell cultures in different stages. So it is very important uh, part of uh, cell testing. And well, uh, we uh, again, maybe a bit of history about uh, cell media. So uh, there's a lot of different cell mediums which use to cultivate your cells. And they called uh, with abbreviation like MM, Alpha MEM, DMEM, RPMI, and so on. And uh, two of these cultures named after its inventor, so MM or called after eagles. It's a high eagle who invented this uh, cell culture. And uh, this one man, Inata Dolbeko, who modified eagle media. And there's called a DMEM, Dolbeko modified eagle medium. Uh, but also it's RPMI very frequently used and this is named after Roswell Park Memorial Institute, so where it was developed. Uh, <clears throat> no, so what's so special about uh, one of these men when, uh, again, a very uh, short glance in history, uh, and this glance is uh, connected with, uh, with why the teacher is so important. So when you picking up your supervisor, oh well, it's maybe a very vital stage in your scientific life because he is a Giuseppe Levi. Uh, he was Italian uh, histologist. Well, maybe a bit familiar in some very narrow, narrow societies, but still, uh, what's so special about this Giuseppe Levi? Uh, he, uh, he has uh, three students. And this student is uh, Rita Levi Montalcini, who is still alive. He is aged 103 years now. And there's a, a lot of different, uh, a lot of different phrases which were devoted to her. May, uh, you may search for her citations in internet and understand what I mean. Uh, the second student was uh, Salvador Edward Luria and the third one is Anato Dolbeco and uh, as you can see there are some years here uh, and this year it's a year of Nobel Prize so all of them all of his three students receive a Nobel Prize in physiology and medicine and so on so uh, we cannot be 100% sure that uh, this is only because of his impact, so because he, he he's not receiving a Nobel Prize uh, himself, but after all, I think that the supervisor teacher important uh, importance is uh, very very important. But well, uh, uh, back to a culture media. Uh, as you can understand, this is, was uh, a very uh, difficult difficult problem to solve how to maintain cell cultures <clears throat> and the scientists spend a lot of time uh, uh, in a brief history I told you that uh, some of the finding was like in the middle of uh, 20th century so it was very hard to understand what should be a composition of culture media for example here is a composition of the mem and as you can see that's not a whole list is just a part of the uh, components which involved in uh, the mem culture. And in some, well, it's just a, a bit different compositions, but still, as you can see, the composition in some things is very, very precise. So randomly, it's it's impossible to randomly pick, this, uh, pick up these components and mix them to obtain uh, spe this specific culture. So it's a very, uh, uh, very spe specifically uh, picked up the components uh, up to, as you can see, it's uh, 0.0072 grams per liter. So uh, that's why it's uh, it was really hard to understand what a uh, right composition for uh, to cultivate your cells. And 
since we are talking about non-toxicity, uh, you must understand that some of the particles have some charges, they can interact with different uh, amino acids, proteins, and so on. And as you can see, there's a lot of, for example, inorganic salts, it's a lot of amino acids, it's a lot of vitamins, and so on. And no one for sure can say how your nanoparticles will interact with this cell culture medium. So, for example, some of you, uh, for example, some of you nanoparticles can uh, sedimentate, so they can aggregate upon interaction with calcium chloride. It's not a, not a surprise should be for you. Almost all of the all of the particles will aggregate in calcium medium because of high ionic states. And uh, probably some of uh, nanoparticles will absorb some of uh, very uh, crucial amino acids, uh, like maybe l or maybe some other, not sure which, which one is more important, l -Lizin. So, uh, well, uh, this will lead to some consequences, and this consequence may lead in decrease in cell viability. And what will happen, you will never understand what is real, the real cause of decreasing in cell viability. It's the impact of nanoparticles, the generation of reactive oxygen species, it's the physical damage and so on, or just depletion of some medium components. So it's just a pure physical absorbance of some amino acids on the surface of nanoparticles. So it's uh, just a hunger of cells. And this will uh, this can cause some uh, decrease in uh, metabolic activity. So, uh, and uh, what's next? Uh, we already discussed a lot of things uh, connected with cell cultures, and you should understand that uh, working with cell cultures uh, have def uh, definitely some stages uh, of work, and these stages. Uh, include uh, obtaining of some primary culture or secondary culture from a cryobank. Uh, it's a passivation of cells or receding, so you need to multiply the cells, and it's usually some flask used or tubes and so on. Uh, you need pr to produce some biomass uh, of the cells to have something to work with. Uh, you need to maintain them while you're working because uh, it's not very suitable to buy them from cryobank every week. And you need to perform some experiments, and of course, during all of the cycles, you need to perform some cryopreservation. So you need to store your cells under uh, liquid, uh, liquid uh, nitrogen, uh, and so on. Uh, and that's not very hard if you're familiar with the stages but they definitely consume a lot of time because you need to maintain sterile conditions you need to spend a lot of money to buy all of this culture plastic uh, culture uh, flask and so on and of course uh, this one is not very easy step two uh, and uh, what why i i'm talking about all of this because uh, you as a scientist who working with nanoparticles or different biomedical uh, things which can be used in different biomedical application probably on some of your stages of your scientific life you will face uh, uh, some needness in performing some experiments with cell cultures and uh, the question is uh, is it hard to pick up a right cell culture or right in vitro model for testing well it's definitely a hard question because if we are talking about uh, our situation in our lab it's usually like i need to test something and you test this on uh, cell cultures which is uh, currently available for you so you are not asking uh, is it uh, normal cell culture or malignant cancer cell culture is it limited or unlimited is it primary or secondary probably 100 percent i will give you it will be secondary cell culture uh, and maybe the question that will be asked uh, that you will be asked by a cell specialist you need to adhere cell culture or suspension cell culture uh, but uh, all of other questions are up to a cell specialist, not for you. But you, 
uh, for example, as one who produced some nanoparticles, for example, you synthesize something and you have some intentions, you know what these nanoparticles can be used for. And uh, it is probably uh, on the first stage, it's your duty to pick a right cell culture for testing. And well, uh, where you will, uh, where and why and how you will obtain this cell culture is another question. But there's a lot of uh, questions to answer between, be, be, uh, before you will start your investigation. Cell cultures also can be transformed or not transformed. So what is transformed cell cultures? Uh, well, some of the malignant cell cultures, cancer cell cultures can divide, uh, so they can be unlimited like HeLa cells. And some of the normal cell cultures, they can undergo some transformation with, for example, some oncoviruses, and these oncoviruses, uh, the cell culture will still normal, still be normal, like epithelial cells, for example, but this normal uh, normal cell culture will divide, uh, will have no limit, <clears throat> so they will uh, divide uh, infinitely, and these cell cultures can call uh, can be called transformed cell cultures. Of course, if you uh, will sequence its genome, there will be some oncoviruses genes in this uh, in genome of your cells. Uh, but still, the cell culture, if you consider its uh, different metabolites, protein, and so on, they will be much closer to normal cell cultures than cancer cells. And of course, you need to. Uh, answer one very important question: What are the uh, what uh, the stage of uh, the cell cell cycle you need? Uh, maybe not uh, in maybe in previous test. Uh, there was a question about glioblastoma treatment, <clears throat> and I mentioned that uh, the drug can affect your cancer cells only during mitosis. We will discuss this in details in the last uh, in the sec uh, uh, in following lecture uh, in the next one, because there are some drugs called docetaxel, and this drug uh, uh, affect tubulin, so it's working only when cell is div uh, dividing, so when cells undergo in mitosis, and if your cells uh, in G zero phase. So they are like uh, occupied all of the available space on your culture plate or culture surface. Uh, there is no difference how many drug you will put in culture media because there is no cells dividing currently at, at this uh, at this right moment. So uh, your drug will not affect the cells, and you not. May uh, you no, uh, not could you must perform your experiments when your cells like in interface so they are dividing in some of the G1 phase, G, G2 phase, and so on. So you must start your experiments when cells up to maybe 60 or 70 percent, as uh, again, uh, cell scientists call this confluence. So, confluence it's a percent of. Uh, it's amount of space occupied by cells. 70% confluence means that 70% uh, of area of your culture plate occupied by cells. 30% free. Uh, so it's a confluence term. Uh, and uh, probably almost all of the experiments starting at the confluence of 60 or 70%. Uh, but uh, also you always uh, need to bear this in mind because it's also very important. And uh, not to mention, of course, uh, in addition to all of these things, you need to understand what kind of tissue you need to use, what uh, uh, kind of, uh, not tissue, from which tissue you need to take the cells to test your uh, drugs, nanoparticles, and so on. And in a couple of slides, we will discuss it in details, because this one is maybe the most important thing. And, uh, well, uh, not only the cell cultures used uh, in the form of monolayer cell cultures for testing different drugs, because there are some other types like cell spheroids. 
So what is cell spheroid? As you can see, some of the cells can form a suspension culture and this suspension culture, well, even adherent cells can be uh, take out of a cell substrate using trypsinization and uh, you can form some spheroids from these cells. Or you can add some polymers to bind these cells to each other again to form some uh, cell spheroids. And this is how cell spheroids looking from some of the nature, nature uh, publishing group papers, maybe some from nature uh, nanotechnology and so on. Uh, and by the way, this is how cell spheroids looks like obtained in our laboratory by Oleg Sotnikov. So uh, not to mention I'm proud of this result. And uh, well, what is so special about cell spheroids? Uh, when we are talking about different tissues, there's uh, a very big concern about uh, tumor growth. When you, a lot of works with nanoparticles connected with tumor treatment. So cancer treatment, we need to deliver something to, uh, to tumor, to some site of the organ, uh, human organism and so on. And uh, when we are talking about uh, uh, this, uh, where to find, and doesn't matter. So when we are talking about some uh, cell cultures in monolayer, uh, all of the nanoparticles, uh, uh, well, uh, all of the cells can be affected by nanoparticles because it's just one layer of the cells. But in a real tumor, well, tumor is just a big spheroid. So in most of the cases, tumor forms some kind of spherical objects, you know, uh, our or animal organism. And some of the cells inside this tumor they are not uh, uh, susceptible for in, uh, interaction with nanoparticles because nanoparticles can interact only with outer shell of uh, so only the cells with uh, from outer shell will uh, affected by nanoparticles and when we are using such kind of cell spheroids we can emulate uh, the behavior of a tumor inside uh, organism so we may understand how nanoparticles can penetrate these cell spheroids, uh, how the spheroids will uh, degrade, how they will die or not die, and so on. So this is a very good model for uh, testing different drugs, which I intended to use for intravenous injection, for cancer treatment, and so on. And now cell spheroids are very frequently used even to bioprinting. So you can print something with the cell spheroids to form some tissues or some something close to tissues. Uh, so cell spheroids is very important and uh, there's a lot of ways to obtain them. But uh, we again already talked about this on uh, very first lecture, but still there's some advanced in vitro, since we're talking about in vitro models, there's some advanced in vitro models called organ on chip. Why is chip? Why organ? So it's even a human on chip, tissue on chip, it's a, a lot of different names. Uh, but why cheap? Because it's called some microfluidic devices, uh, maybe obtained from PDMAS polymer. So in our lab, a lot of people working with PDMAS polymers and uh, microfluidic chips now. And uh, but uh, in the end, all of these chips are still cell cultures. So you can uh, uh, produce these chips uh, with some biocompatible, uh, biocompatible layers and you can seed your cells on these layers like for example this one so it's just one cell culture and another cell culture and you can study some interaction on the border between these cells, uh, two cultures for example some transports through this border or something like this one and uh, despite it's called organ on chip it's so far from real organ because in real organism you have a lot of vessels you have a capillary system you have a macrophages you have neutrophils lycocytes you have different immune response you have a blood uh, surrounding this tissue you have a lymph you have a neurohumoral system you have a hormones and so on and you have nothing of this in organ on chip system so Probably it's a bit more advantageous in comparison with cell cultures, but still it's a very, very far from a real organ. 
and you probably can even grow some epithelium like structures so like lungs epithelium to study how nanoparticles ca will penetrate your lungs when you inhale them and so on but still it's just in vitro experiments and uh, when we're talking about different in vitro models there can be some artificial for example here it's artificial circulating system components so well most of these things intended to use in human organisms so it's artificial heart valve uh, printed by uh, printed from some polymers and then it can be seeded with cells and implanted in human organism but you also can test this uh, valve of in your for example artificial circulating system or using some artificial vessels artificial arteries or veins uh, to check if your nanoparticles will interact with these valves, how they will interact, will they damage, uh, damage them or adsorb on the surface and so on. Uh, so almost every uh, model, uh, there was a question in your introductory test, every model created by a human from uh, cells or created artificially by a human called in vitro systems. So it uh, probably doesn't matter uh, uh, so it's a very hard question about uh, if you take some primary cell culture from an uh, animal, for example, a human, and use it as a test system. Is it can be called in vitro or ex vivo? Because uh, what is ex vivo models? Well, ex vivo models, for example, it's lung models. You can take a whole lung, one or both lungs, or you can take a heart, you can take a brain, out of an animal, probably for now not from a human, but still, uh, with some uh, with some permissions, you can take even from a human, I think, uh, obviously from a dead human, uh, and uh, you can use them to test something. But you must understand that some of the ex vivo experiments they are very expensive and very very complicated. Uh, despite the fact it's just a peristaltic pump which used some uh, blood, maybe even some artificial blood, and there's some mechanical ventilator which used to uh, ventilate these lungs. But uh, in most of the cases, ex vivo techniques and ex vivo models not so complicated because it's... Uh, uh, well, uh, if you have some uh, uh, capabilities in your lab to... Uh, uh, take a whole heart or uh, lungs from an animal why not just test some of your nanoparticles inside animals so what's the, what's the purpose of taking some of the organs out of a uh, animal or a human and test on them well because in the animal it's not very easy to uh, analyze the results precisely using for example microscope so when something happened to an organ, it's uh, it's a stomach, stomach for example, it's some part of a skin with the nerves and spinal cord used for some investigations. So even part of an uh, organism, not a whole organ, just a um, system, organ system can be taken out, and uh, it is possible to study some of the very uh, very precise things, uh, for example, again, using the microscope or using some laser and so on, because when you are working with animals, uh, those of you who ever worked with animals know that this is a very hard to work with animal, especially if you have dissect this animal, you have a blood, you have organs, you need to maintain animal life and so on. And this uh, not very, uh, as Alexei mentioned in chat, it's uh, a lot of uh, ethical challenges and uh, not uh, everyone uh, ready to work with animals. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, well, uh, one thing when you well, kill some animal with some uh, ethically approved uh, procedure, procedures and so on and take some part of the animal some skin or some organ and the, another situation when you're working on animal under anesthesia and uh, after this one you need to wake up this animal and probably this animal will suffer so it's a lot of ethical questions when we're talking about 
uh, in vivo models. So, uh, so in some cases, ex vivo models also can be used. And just again, for you to understand, if, if we take in something from a living organism out of this organism, it can be called ex vivo model. So it's out of in vivo organism. And uh, again, uh, going back to, for example, hepatocytes, if we take in some hepatocytes or other primary cell culture of an or from an organism, uh, it's a good question. What uh, can it can be called? Well, it's cell culture, so it's probably in vitro model, but it's just taken from an organism, so it can be called ex vivo model. And this is uh, everything depends on probably on you. So it can be both in vitro and ex vivo models simultaneously. Uh, but uh, I'm, I will be not discuss different x models here because still we are talking about in vitro toxicity and uh, I believe this is more than enough for you to understand how even in vitro models uh, uh, in vitro models used in uh, laboratory routine. So a couple of slides, uh, maybe three, uh, about uh, why it is important to pick up a right model for testing of your drugs so uh this slides uh, you already see the slide because the slides is from previous lectures and for example this one about uh hem polymer which is used in some dental fillings in our teeth and so on so this polymer is biocompatible but there's some articles which stated this that this polymer is not biocompatible and it's caused some uh, apoptosis of about 10% of the cells compared to control. So it's uh, it's almost double the amount of dead cells. And this will, will probably result in some inflammation, uh, inflammation in your epithelial uh, tissue surrounding your teeth. But if we are looking deeply in this article, what are cells uh, used for this investigation? And it bears to be cells which is human lung epithelial cells. And the question arises why they are using lung epithelial cells when they are assessing something about our mouse. So what, what is, uh, why not to take some cells from, uh, from a tissue from our mouse? So it's uh, uh, a good question after all. But still, it's a human normal cells. It's epithelial cells. Probably the results will not differ uh, differ considerably from each other. But again, next example. There are some cryptosome functionalized uh, nanoparticles used for brain delivery. As I mentioned, cryptosome particles are very frequently used to deliver something to brain because uh, from uh, our nose, they can go uh, straightly uh, through olfactory nerve to our brain. So it's a very good, uh, good type of interbrain, intrabrain delivery. But again, uh, what type of cells are used to assess biocompatibility of their particles? It's A549 cells. And this, uh, these cells are known as uh, adenocarcinoma of lungs. So it's not even a brain cells, it's not a neuron cells, it's not epithelial or epithelial cells from our nose and so on, it's a cancer cells from lungs. Why take cancer cells to assess some biocompatibility of something intended to use in brains? Uh, well, to say, of course, they have some histological, uh, histopathological investigation of nasal mucosa samples, uh, nasal mucosa tissues, uh, which shows in some ways some very, uh, very limited, bio, uh, uh, very limited toxicity. Uh, so it's already good. Okay, nasal mucosa is good, but there is no assessment of toxicity of these particles to some neuron cells or uh, brain, uh, blood brain barrier cells and so on. Of course, it's impossible to test your particles on every cell cultures. It's obvious. But you at least can pick something a bit closer to where your nanoparticles intended to be used. And by the way, in this paper, they also assess some embryo fetal toxicity. 
And this is very strange because where is brain and where is fetal toxicity? But they found something. Uh, and <laughs> this is very strange. Now, because, uh, well, uh, as for me, uh, again, it's obvious that they, uh, prior to the study, they know that these particles can somehow, from uh, our nose, can bypass this olfactory pathway and accumulate in fetus or uh, in some other places of reproductive system. So, this is very strange. And again, maybe the last example. Uh, again, you see this already. Uh, again, chitosan or the saccharide coated iron nanoparticles, which is used for brain delivery, assessed hello cells. I wouldn't take, uh, wouldn't talk much about this already. Do not uh, assess anything on hello cells. It's again lung cells, lung cancer cells, and it's uh, HEC 293 cells, which is kidneys epithelium cells. Uh, why uh, they use kidney epithelium cells? Uh, because kidney epithelium cells will probably interact with these nanoparticles when they will go to kidneys. But why, uh, why not to take cupro cells, hepatocytes? Why not to ta uh, take spleen, uh, spleen uh, epithelial cells? Uh, because a lot of particles can be found in spleen. Why these cells? And the answer is very obvious, because only these cells were available in the lab at, at this very moment. And this is the only answer to very strange uh, and, uh, well, to say, wrong models for cytotoxicity assessment, because the results obtained on these cells, they, no, forgive me my words, but this is just a bullshit. So, and uh, if you're going further, for example, again, Assessing of uh, another pegylated particles, uh, chitosan pegylation and permeability and so on. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, a lot of results obtained on pegylated chitosan and we are looking again what cells used, Carlos three cells, lung cancer. Again for uh, brain delivery. Uh, well, the only explanation why they all using lung cells because these particles can with air be inhaled in your lungs but still there's a lot of cell cultures of normal lung cells not a cancer lung cells and uh, well uh, there is really a hard things when we are talking about full testing cycle so uh, as I said, the answer why they are picking up their own models because uh, they are taking what they are given to uh, cells, cell specialists, cell uh, cell researchers, uh, cell uh, so from cell department gave them this. Take a hella cells. Uh, this is will be okay. And well, they take a hella cells. Uh, a proper investigation will be probably con uh, consisted of five stages. So if you want to make everything perfect it's a perfect case a full testing cycle the first one will be started from some unspecific cell lines maybe even cancer cell lines uh, this one for example again hella cell lines now uh, what you will be uh, you what you are able to obtain from testing on these uh, cells some very very preliminary results so uh, if your nanoparticle is toxic or non-toxic that's all it's uh, not worth even to uh, speak about persons of viability and so on because it's uh, it will be uh, it will have no connection with re with real life. And uh, further, you will proceed to some specific cell lines for normal cell lines. For example, this one it's Huvex cells. It's a endocellular cells, not epithelium. Endocellular cells, which is inlining our vessels. So this is where specific cell lines, they require some specific conditions to maintain, to cultivate the cells, and they are not very cheap, let's say. And no, this is the next stage. If you, for example, you have some intravenous drug, for example, again, for thrombosis treatment, yeah, as our magnetite uh, nanoparticles. Uh, so probably you need to test them on some specific cell lines, and further you need to pro uh, proceed to some advanced in vitro models. 
For example, some organs on chip, some artificial vessels covered with these lines and so on. And these advanced in vitro models can be very expensive. In some cases, they can be even more uh, expensive than animal models because you need to develop this system or buy this system. And for example, some organs on chip can cost uh, hundreds of dollars uh, and well, some animals can be bought much, much cheaper. Uh, again, ethical challenges here. Uh, but, uh, for example, some uh, decelerized uh, cell scaffolds are very cheap and they can substitute some in vitro models. But on the next stage, you will probably switch to some ex vivo models. And uh, in case of thrombosis, uh, ex vivo models can be like a native clot. So this is just how clots looks like after removal from a human organism. It's uh, quite big because it's a petri dish with diameter of nine centimeters. So it's a very big clot. And you will probably place this ex vivo clot in some in vitro vessel or uh, in some silicon tube and use it as a test model. And this is a, will be very close to a human organism if you pick up a right uh, uh, flow, uh, flow velocity, right temperature, and so on. But the next stage, obviously, it's in vivo models. So it's, uh, well, again, not nicely looking, but still we also performed very similar looking experiments. And uh, this, uh, again, it's a perfect case when you have a lot of money, you have a lot of laboratory equipment, a lot of people, you have a cell lab, you have some uh, funds to buy these in vitro models, you have some time, you have some uh, uh, some doctors who can bring you some ex vivo uh, explants and so on, and you have place to uh, for some animals and so on. But in most cases, uh, in most researches, scientists can skip almost all of these models and there's even cases when they can skip from unspecific cell lines right to in vivo models. And if you look, uh, I think you have a, a very uh, wide experience in reading scientific papers. In some cases, they are hella cells and mice, and there is no specific cell lines and so on. But if you will found something very interesting in your in vivo models, for example, some toxicity related to vessel walls, some toxicity related to liver or to kidney, you will probably need some additional investigations uh, about these organs. And these additional investigations will, uh, will require uh, you to come back to some specific cell lines or maybe some in vitro models, because it's not very easy. If, of, of course, you can perform some histopathological investigation. You can obtain some <coughs> slices of liver, of uh, uh, kidneys, and so on. But if you want to understand what so specific happened to, for example, hepatocytes, you will probably need to obtain some hepatocytes incubated with your nanoparticles to give some explanation what happened, what, what is the cause of uh, liver toxicity, for example. And if you, uh, and uh, as it was in our case, for example, we uh, observed some dissolution of clots in uh, rats, in rabbits. But what was the real cause of this dissolution? So, why nanoparticles affect the dissolution speed? And to answer these questions, we uh, moved back two steps to in vitro models to understand what happens to our uh, nanoparticles when they interact with uh, clots. And in proper investigation, well, obviously we should perform this before we start in experiments with animals because some of the questions uh, may be answered even in the, on this stage. Uh, so what the what is the what the conclusions? Uh, the conclusion is that you need probably pick up and uh, pick up the proper models because proper models will save a lot of your time and it will give you a lot of valuable information and you just won't spend won't waste much time testing your nanoparticles on a wrong model in wrong system 
wasting time, wasting money, and obtaining some results which can be published in a good paper. So it's just some precautions for you and I hope that they will be useful. And this is the last slide for today. So if you have any questions, you are free to ask them in chat. And I, after this lecture, maybe in 10 minutes, I waiting for all of you, I hope some of you, except those who want, uh, those who should present their topics, also will attend because it's like a couple of people was uh, in later Zoom session. So in ten minutes, waiting for you in Zoom, three people today should present their uh, topics. Uh, this uh, this uh, um, ho, 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 ho. Uh, Sergey. Georgi and Anastasia. So the rest of you will be, except for Alexei, the rest of you will be on next uh, Wednesday. And again, do not forget to upload your reports in this folder. Oh, I hear Alina uploaded. Just presentation. So report will give you 20 points. It's a lot of points, you must understand. So, uh, checking the chat there is no questions then thank you for your attention again and uh, meet you in zoom session in 10 minutes